We're looking at tulip fever and adaptation with Rob Martinson of Cold Spring Harbor Lab, ahead on Science Goes to the Movies. And hey, if, if they're all about plants, does that make them vegan movies? Welcome to Science Goes to the Movies, a look at the stories of science and how they change our culture. I'm Faith Saley. In most of the movies that feature plants, the plants are frightening. They're growing, sentient and carnivorous and coming to eat us. In Little Shop of Horrors, the man-eating plant even bursts into song about it. It's a little terrifying, a little bit awesome. But today, I'm sitting with Professor Rob Martinson of Cold Spring Harbor Lab. Professor Martinson studies the secondary genetic code, the epigenome of plants, and he is fairly certain no plant ever sang any song ever. <laughs> I don't know, you haven't no, met Audrey too yet, have you? Right. <laughs> Rob, thank you for being here today. No, no, it's a great pleasure. So, all right, let's talk about some flower movies. Yep. Tulip Fever is a 2017 flick set in 17th century Holland when trading tulip bulbs was the then current get rich quick version of Beanie Babies or Bitcoin. And while you could make some money on a solid colored tulip flower, the holy grail was the variegated or striped tulip flower. First to flower, first to fall. Okay, Rob, so let's say that you could go back in time to the 17th century, to Holland. Could you, with your modern scientific knowledge, make a fortune creating or breeding variegated tulip bulbs? Oh, well, I think we probably could. I mean, you know, even without the benefits of a 21st century lab or genetic modification, we understand a lot about variegation now and, and what causes it and, and how to manipulate it. And in fact, tulip breeders several hundred years later were able to make variegated tulips. But the variegation, the pattern of striping wasn't quite the same as the, as the famous ones that were worth you know, 10,000 guilders back in the, uh, in the 1630s. So uh, there are definitely you know, things we can learn about that. But it, it should be said that the tulip bulb industry is now a billion dollar industry in Holland. And uh, so it wasn't entirely uh, wow. speculation. <laughs> and we should also define variegation. Absolutely. A stripe? Yeah, variegation is, is a stripe. So, uh, for example, you might see uh, a striped pattern on a flower, and that striped pattern is very interesting because some cells are clearly expressing a gene, for example, for color, for the red color, and other cells are not, even though the whole flower is genetically identical. So every cell has the same genetic uh, components, the same genes. Uh, and that's why we call it epigenetics, because it's an epigenetic above the genes that's causing this change in color. And these stripe colors were extremely attractive to the uh, you know, 17th century Dutch and, and, and took on a sort of life of their own economically. In the movie, we see that a fortune could be won or lost by the possibility of producing a bulb that had a variegated flower, right? right. And the idea is that the bulb might create other variegated flowers. Is that how it works? Is, is that how a tulip is fertile? Well, right, so, so the, 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 unfortunately, the, uh, the very beautiful striping patterns that, that they were dealing with are actually caused by a virus. Uh, it's an RNA virus, it's called tulip breaking virus, and these are called breaker tulips. Uh, and it was a virus that caused these, these patterns for reasons that we now understand a lot, a lot better than they did then. And if, in fact, the virus was only transmitted from bulb to bulb, not through the seed. So you couldn't breed for the virus, right? I mean, you know, the virus was an infectious agent. Uh, they didn't understand this. Um, but in fact, the virus eventually killed the bulb. So the bulbs didn't last for years and years and years as they, as they would if they weren't infected. So in a sense, the whole project was doomed from the start by this, uh, by this RNA virus. The viruses are transmitted by aphids, um, and the aphids uh, were probably there because of the fruit tree industry in Holland at the time. Um, they had no idea this was happening. So in fact, it was, it was very random as to whether your, your tulip would uh, contract this virus or not, and it, and it was very difficult to transmit it. I mean, you, you could by, by splitting the bulbs and by taking offshoots of the bulbs, but it wouldn't be passed through the seed. You and your colleagues at Cold Spring Harbor uh, study variegation specifically. Now, the, the Dutch were into the stripes for the beauty of them. Right. 
But why is variegation important to understand in modern science? So variegation is very interesting, both from a basic scientific point of view as well as from a practical point of view. So in basic science, the fact that genes are on or off in different cells that are otherwise genetically identical is very, very interesting. And we That is epigenetics, That is yes. epigenetics. And the first examples of that were found actually in fruit flies and also in maize. In maize by Barbara McClintock, who was a mentor maize, of mine. Maize, corn, yeah, corn, corn, corn as corn, we say sorry. here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and she was working on variegated corn. And she discovered that, that was, the variegation was caused by a jumping gene, if you like. She called them transposable elements. Uh, so they're elements that can transpose. We sometimes call them jumping genes. And she won the Nobel Prize for that in the, in the 1980s. Um, and it turns out that jumping genes are related to viruses in many ways. They both produce the same uh, sort of very small but very important and powerful genetic signal called a small RNA. Small RNA. RNA, RNA right. So everybody knows about DNA. Yeah. DNA in your genome. The DNA has uh, four letters, A, G, C, T, that are you know, written in a, in, a, in a genetic code. And small RNAs are little pieces of, of RNA, which is closely related to DNA, but they're only like 20 letters long, but that's enough to match uniquely somewhere in the, in the genome and, for example, to target a transposable element or a virus or something like that. And these small RNAs, we think, are what's responsible for that on-off switch. Is, in anything? Uh, it, yes, yes, pr in principle in anything. And, and in fact, variegation is very common. I, I couldn't resist bringing along this little prop. Um. We love props here at Science <laughs> Goes to the Movies. So I was literally in Whole Foods the other day uh, looking for blood. No, 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 no. You, that, that's not real. This is real. You this did not a, draw that on with a marker? No, this is a blood orange. Uh, and blood oranges uh, are actually caused. A friend of mine in the UK discovered this quite recently. Uh, the, the, the red color in a blood orange is caused by one of these transposable elements. And it's controlling a gene that causes it to be red, as in, the, as in the red fruit. And every now and then, an epigenetic change occurs, and you now get red in the skin as well. And that's exactly what that is. So this is, this is just like those tulips. In I case. mean, <laughs> surely this has to be worth millions of dollars somewhere, Well, there you Rob. go. Maybe this is the new Bitcoin, you know, blood <laughs> oranges from Whole Foods. But uh, <laughs> Wait, why have I never noticed that? Is that rare? <laughs> is uh, it's actually not as rare as you might think. I asked my friend, and she said it happens quite a bit. I mean, one in a thousand or so oranges. I was extremely lucky to find this one. Uh, it was just sitting it's there. It's your lucky the, day, my friend. Exactly. Thank you for bringing that. That's sure, really, yeah, no, that's, please. I really did think that you drew that on with marker no, to no. show me what a stripe looks like. <laughs> it's like a tiger orange. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so, so do, doesn't, from what little I understand of epigenetics, um, the on-off switch of these, right. um, of these genes, is that right? Yeah. Um, that can be created by the environment, by a virus, by an aphid, That's by... Right. It absolutely can. In it also, humans, by smoking, yep, whatever. All sorts of things, and lots of environmental effects. Um, and it's very important in plants because uh, in, in some cases we propagate plants without going through sexual propagation. So this is co sometimes called cloning. In fact, cloning is also in the movies in a, in a big way, of course. So this is where uh, you, uh, you, you split a bulb or you put cells into tissue culture and then regenerate individual plants without going through a sexual generation, without going through seed. And when that happens, you're taking cells that could potentially be epigenetically different, even though they're genetically the same. A very good example is in, in grapevine. So um, we all like our wine. So uh, Pinot Noir, Pinot uh, Blanc, and Pinot Gris are all genetically very, very similar. They're, they're all clones of each other. Um, but Pinot Blanc has a transposable element in the red gene. Pinot Gris has got a little rearrangement in that transposable element that gives it this, this lovely uh, sort of pale color instead of, instead of the white. So, I mean, clonally propagated grapes, uh, epigenetics is really important to the different phenotypes that those grapes have. I mean, Pinot Noir has been propagated uh, vegetatively since the 13th century, I and mean, it hasn't had sex since then. Oh, so God, the, uh, no wonder it needs so much wine. Exactly. <laughs> um, but so many plants are propagated that way, and so this, this sort of variation is actually quite important. One of the most successful flower-centric movies was the 2002 film Adaptation, based very loosely on Susan Orlean's nonfiction book, The Orchid Thief. Why are orchids so special? Orchids are special. Uh, there's actually thousands of species of orchids, and they grow all over the world, but the, by far most of the species are found in the tropics. Uh, and they're actually very difficult also to propagate from seed. They need special fungi and other things to germinate, and then it takes six or seven years before they flower. 
Uh, so orchids are quite rare. I mean, a rare orchid would be difficult to you know, propagate in, in the normal way. So actually orchids are cloned. Uh, orchids are, are the most cloned plant that there is. Uh, and you can actually do this at home. I have friends uh, who are complete amateur orchid fanciers who if you take a little piece of an orchid shoot and, uh, and uh, plate it out in tissue culture, uh, you can regenerate uh, many, many identical orchids which all have the same, the same pattern. And in fact, in that book, in The Orchid Thief, uh, they're looking for this very rare ghost orchid and they want to clone it. That's, that's actually exactly what they want to do. So cloning is really important to, uh, to orchids and it does make them special in, in some important sense. Books and movies are full of these, these pop culture tropes right. with the humble gardener and the cerebral scientist. But in these particular films, the, the characters' interests in plants are all passion and beauty and obsession. Do you get some of that excitement I, in real plant science? I actually do. I really do. Like the, like the blood orange that I just showed you. I mean, I, I, think, I think there are lots of examples everywhere. I mean, when I walk through a botanic garden or even just a regular park, I, I, I really have a good time. I mean, because once you... Why? Understand... What do you... When I walk through, I may say, oh, that's so pretty or it smells good. But what do you as a scientist see right. and feel? When you understand a little bit more about, you know, how these things happen, then even a tree, you know, can look very different. So, for example, there are trees that also have this variegated pattern where, you know, half the tree will be a different color somehow to, to another one. Camellias are a good example. And sometimes you'll have huge uh, sports where all the branches have turned fully red colored flowers and, and some of them aren't. And so you can, you can see these genetic patterns everywhere. They're actually very common. Once you know what to look for, it's, uh, it's quite exciting. Actually. In studying plant variegation, as you do, is your focus on just on learning more and more about plants and why different ep epigenetic things happen to them? Or is there always an idea that let's extrapolate this and apply it to human genes? Very much. So, so the, the basic science that we're learning, for example, these small RNAs that control transposable elements and viruses, uh, tell us a lot about what happens in, in human disease and in, and in human development. So cancer, for example, a, a tumor is not uniform. It's, it's highly heterogeneous. And that heterogeneity is very important when you come to treat a tumor with various drugs and so on. And some of that heterog heterogeneity is actually variegation. It's epigenetic variegation. The same sort of thing as you'll see in a tulip flower is actually in a tumor as well. So some of the mechanisms that we're discovering are very important even for medicine. The original writer of The Orchid Thief, Susan Orlean, is on the record as saying that she was so strongly opposed to the way Charlie Kaufman altered her book to suit the screen that she nearly refused to let it go into production. But she eventually did okay the changes, and now we have this great weird movie. You know, it seems like that kind of emotional response to change is, is a good metaphor for what's going on in the world of GMO right now. I actually really like that analogy. Um, there's a lot to be said for that. Um, so when we think about genetic modification... And GMO stands for genetically oh, modified organisms? Organism, exactly. Or, okay. so genetically modified organism. So when we think about genetic modification itself, it's a process. It's a technology, a technique. A bit like ad adapting you know, a novel for a screenplay. It's a technique. There's nothing inherently dangerous about doing that. There's nothing about that that will tell you that the movie is going to be rubbish. Um, <laughs> it's just a technique. Uh, but the product, the GMO, is all of these GMOs are different. They're all different products, just like different movies are made from different books. And what's interesting about adaptation is actually it's, it, the movie is about the process itself, uh, about the process of adaptation, rather than being what the novelist, you know, or the, actually it wasn't a novel, but uh, uh, what, the, story, the, what yeah. the story was really about. Uh, and so I think, you know, in the public's mind, you can often confuse the process with the product. So there's nothing inherently wrong with the process. There's nothing dangerous or anything like that about the process itself. But products should be regulated and products should be carefully, you know, and, and companies are very careful when they make uh, GMO products to make sure they're safe and, and so on. Uh, there are examples for, uh, of, of uh, GMO products that, that weren't safe or, or were pulled before they were uh, ever put out, a, a famous one that uh, was made by a seed company in the United States who were working on soybeans. And they wanted to make soybeans more nutritious for chickens. 
And to do that, they uh, took a gene from Brazil nuts and put it into the soybean because that gene encodes a lot more nutrition for, uh, for, for chickens. But of course, some humans are allergic to Brazil nuts. And so they realized this and they realized that that particular protein was, was bad news for those allergies. So they didn't make that GMO. So the product itself is something that we should pay attention to. But the actual process, genetic modification, just like adaptation, is not in itself inherently uh, dangerous at all. Then why is there so much controversy around GMOs? I think that's part of the explanation, is that, is that you know, people don't think about the end result. They think about the, the process itself as being somehow wrong. I mean, it's actually an interesting uh, evolution, sort of in, in cultural evolution. Uh, back in the middle, middle Ages, the, uh, the church uh, objected to farmers' attempts to breed. I mean, in those days, they didn't do deliberate crosses or anything. They just saved their best seed for the next generation and tried to make improvements uh, in, their, uh, in their crops. And, 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 the, and the church actually said that this was playing God, uh, <laughs> which is an interesting... Uh, interesting way of yeah. looking at it and in fact uh, animal breeding uh, dogs for example you know have been uh, dramatically changed over a very short period of time just by normal breeding i mean that's not anything to do with dna or genetic or, or genetic manipulation of dna um, so so i think in in a sense uh, people are confusing you know the, the 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 process with the product even if you assured me though if you held up a, a naturally grown tomato right or tomato, as you yes. would probably say, <laughs> and a genetically, a GMO one, and you said, well, here, you can choose one. I, I just want the real one. I would just well, feel, a, a, even though you are assuring me that there is absolutely right. no harm in scientifically modifying an organism that we eat. It's funny you should raise that example. I mean, in fact, genetically modified tomatoes, and they were called tomatoes, were the first, <laughs> were the first genetically modified organisms to, to, be, uh, to be marketed, and this was done in the UK. Uh, by ICI, it was called at the time. And they made a tomato that uh, would ripen without disintegrating. Okay, so that meant that it tasted a lot better. And in fact, they did taste tests, and, and the general public knew that this was genetically modified, and, the, and they preferred the genetically modified one. It was only later that GMOs got this bad reputation. And so you do have to ask yourself why that was, and, and I'm not sure I really know. You mentioned that the ages ago, the, the church didn't think that farmers should sort of yep. control how their crops turned out, right? It wasn't Mendel. Yep. We all know, remember monk. Mendel's peas, right? <laughs> In fact, he was an abbot. He was a monk. He was yep. an abbot? Yep. And, and he's kind of the father of genetic studies, isn't he? He certainly is. And uh, I've been Was to he the, I've ex been excommunicated to or something? Uh, he wasn't. I mean, this was the medieval church that was objecting to breeding. Um, but it's very interesting that he saw somehow the sort of the abstract beauty of the universe in the nature of the gene. I mean, he didn't know the gene was DNA, you know, or anything like that. Uh, but just the pattern of inheritance of wrinkled peas, for example, uh, you know, struck him as, as, as somehow aesthetically important. And so we sort of get back to this idea of beauty, uh, where, where in fact plant science has a very strong aesthetic component, even in the abstract. Uh, but yeah, he didn't, uh, he didn't consider that blasphemous at all. <laughs> you probably see, with the science that you do, based on plants, there's so many life metaphors all the time. It, it's, it's rather philosophical, because it, it keeps is. coming back to beauty and health. Absolutely. And care. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, I mean, plants, uh, not, it's not just agriculture. I mean, plants uh, have, have figured very, very prominently in all of our uh, uh, cultural uh, life, of course, and, and, and civilization in a big way. We've been tweaking our plants and food long before GMOs. As we saw in the movie Tulip Fever back in the 17th century, the Dutch were trying to breed a striped tulip. And here's a 17th century painting by Giovanni Stonky of a watermelon. Ugh. And, and here's a picture of an unevolved banana. Yuck. And these wild carrots also look fairly unappetizing. I read that you're working specifically with, um, to, to increase the yield of palm oil trees. That's right. To reduce the threats to the, to the, the rainforest, endangered exactly. rainforest. Is there a huge difference between your work with palm oil trees and the you know, bananas and watermelons and, <laughs> and carrots that were modified to suit our well, needs absolutely. that we eat? So that's right. So crop plants, of course, have undergone breeding and domestication uh, in some cases for thousands of years. So, for example, oil palms and watermelons actually both come from Africa. Oil palms from sub-Saharan Africa and 
and uh, watermelons from southern Africa, but both showed up in uh, pharaoh's graves in the pyramids in ancient Egypt. So, you know, we've been, we've been uh, domesticating these particular wow. crops for literally thousands of years. Uh, and, you know, they get, they, most of this happens very slowly because originally, you know, our ancestors could, all the, the best they could do was just to pick the best seeds. But, uh, but nowadays, of course, you know, we like to have very uniform and uh, easy to eat uh, crops. So, for example, bananas and watermelons don't have seeds uh, most of the time. Uh, there's, there's a very easy to understand reason for that, which is that they, they're both triploid. What that means is that they have three sets of chromosomes instead of two. So most organisms have two sets of chromosomes, one from the mother, one from the father. So every cell in your body has the same set of two chromosomes. But uh, those, those commercial varieties actually have three sets. Uh, and so in the case of- Why? Uh, well, because triploids, because they can't sort their chromosomes, because there are three, they can't divide them into two. Uh, and that means that their seed don't develop properly because they don't have the right genetic components. Oh. Uh, and so in the case of watermelon, for example, that's why seedless watermelon actually does have seed, but they're very, very tiny yeah. and, they, and they're basically- They're, they're triploid. impotent. Exactly. Uh, case of bananas, actually, they've, uh, they've circumvented the whole process by, um, by uh, cultivating them through clones. So actually, most of the commercial bananas you'll find are all the same clone, amazingly enough. Um, so clonal variation uh, is, is very important in bananas as well. It's funny, the, the, the triploid, the, the death of triploid seeds, if you like, we've recently discovered that's also caused by these same small RNAs coming through from the, from the pollen, from the male parent. So there is a big connection between epigenetics and, and, and how these uh, plants have been bred. In tulip fever, everyone was just guessing about what a plant might produce. Are we st still guessing? Uh, not anymore. I mean, we have a pretty good idea. I mean, epigenetics is still a frontier science and, and being able to predict things like bad karma in oil palm is, is, a, is a very new uh, technology and, and, and we're very excited about being able to do that. But in terms of the genetic uh, constitution of plants, through genome sequencing and DNA technology, we can now do a pretty good job of predicting the outcome of, of any given uh, genetic cross or any, any breeding or any genetic modification we want to. In all the glorious old plant-based horror movies, the, the killer shrubbery was either evil or magic. Um, but these days, if a screenwriter really wants to scare us, he or she delves into real sci science for a real scare. In season two, Episode four of the Netflix series Travelers, an activist is trying to prevent the release of a dangerous agricultural product, something called Seed C589, which extracts an enormous amount of nutrients from the soil in order to yield an increased harvest. But the plant also contains the genes of the kudzu plant. The show's heroes have traveled through time to stop seed C589 from spreading across the earth, destroying most of the soil, creating a worldwide famine. Okay, Rob, <laughs> in real life, could, could the combination of a super nutrient sucking thing like kudzu actually become dangerous? I know, I, I grew up with Day of the Triffids, which I still think is one of the great plant horror movies and, and books. What was it, Day of the Day what? of the Triffids. Triffids, so that sounds walking, like tribbles. Yeah, walking plants that uh, make make humans blind and all this sort of thing. It's, uh, it's, it's, and I grew up in Georgia where kudzu was just, it's just yeah, all yeah, over yeah. the highway. It's, uh, yeah. invasive. No, what I would say is that, you know, we don't need any of these horror stories uh, to make us worried about nitrogen and phosphorus, for example, uh, or, uh, or, or invasive species. So, you know, the intensity of modern agriculture is such that we are very rapidly depleting the Earth's resources of inorganic nitrogen, nitrates, and, and inorganic phosphorus especially, so they're not going to last very much longer. And we're pouring them onto the land anyway, uh, especially like places like the Midwest, where it all ends up in the Mississippi and then flows down the river and, and, and creates this dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. And in terms of invasive species with climate change, a lot of species are finding much broader ranges than they ever did before. So we, you know, we don't need a horror movie to warn us about this stuff. So in fact, a lot of effort is going into, uh, including in my own research, into finding ways to recycle nutrients, to use plants to actually absorb these nutrients, but then to put them back on the fields, for example, or to feed them to animals or something like that, to recycle the nitrates and, phosph and phosphates, which would otherwise uh, very rapidly run out. Um, so yeah, there are real 
concerns about agriculture and you know it's just the population has to get fed somehow and uh, we have to make it a lot more efficient um, in fact most of most of our efforts in that direction are to make plants use much less nitrogen uh, for example by letting them fix it from the air or, or, or something like that uh, rather than uh, than sucking it all out of the earth uh, but it is a good wake-up call I think for um, for environmentalists uh, all over the world to, to really pay attention to agriculture because it really is an important aspect of all of this. Yeah, I don't think we hear, we hear about carbon, not yeah. CO2, we hear about you know, the hole in the ozone, um, but, but you're yeah. saying we, we are losing nitrates and phosphates? Yeah, well, it's, that's right. But, you're, but they're being spread all over, you said they're, they're also being spread all over the ground? They are. In the Midwest so, and going so, down the yeah, river? So but fertilizers are, are, are in widespread use in agriculture. I mean, not just- And that's US, okay. Everywhere. It's or necessary not. It's necessary to get the high yields that you want. The trouble is that those fertilizers just run off. They end up running into the ocean and so you've essentially lost them. So recovering them somehow is, is something that we're very interested in doing. Uh, and actually we're using aquatic plants to do that because aquatic plants can absorb these, uh, these nitrates and phosphates and then you can just literally pick them up and feed them to, a, to an animal or use them as a fertilizer on, on plants again. So you can recycle the nutrients. I mean, how urgent, this is, I'm alarmed, how urgent is the ticking clock on this? Uh, it's quite urgent, actually. I mean, just as climate change is urgent as well, the, uh, the, especially phosphates are, are in, uh, so phosphates are mined uh, in, in, in Africa, for example, and then shipped all over the world as, as phosphate fertilizer. Uh, but unless you recycle it, you know, it's, it's, gone. it's gone. Are there scientists like you working around the clock, oh, yeah. around the world? Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like we have to get you back to Cold Springs Harbor Lab, yeah. all right? <laughs> so th I, this is all we have time for today. We gotta get you back to work. Um, thank you for coming. It's sure. really fascinating. That was great, I appreciate it.